good to be in the house of God today, amen? amen? Again, thank you so much for allowing my wife and I to escape and go to the Big Apple and enjoy ourselves. It was nice. It's good to be home. We left the Big Apple Saturday morning. It was 28 degrees, so I had my sweater and my coat, and I was bundled up. Got on the airplane, landed in Houston. It was 74, amen? Amen. <laughs> So, it's like a major metamorphosis. So, I traded in my sweater and bought me a t-shirt. Tell them what kind of t-shirt you bought, though. My wife gets mad at me. I, I bought a t-shirt. It had long sleeves. And she's like, well, you're going from one long No, you're going from a sweater to a long, t- long sleeve t-shirt. That's a difference, isn't it? You should be happy it said Texas on it. Amen? <laughs> the only reason I bought it was on sale. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have bought a Texas t-shirt unless it was going to say, oh, amen. If you're, from, if you're from Texas, don't throw rocks at me. I still love you, amen. Don't have to like the Cowboys to love you, amen. Oh, I, didn't feel, I felt the anointing almost lift right there. If you want to have the anointing, you've got to be a Saints fan, amen. Well, I could hear, I could feel it rumbling, man. When you pastor a, a church diversified as this, you got Pennsylvania, you got Seattle, you got <laughs> Baltimore, you got all of them, man. But let me ask you a question. Does the Bible say anything about any other team other than saints in the Bible? Amen. Hawks? Like an eagle? Man. You can feel the crowd. You lose them just in a quick second like that, you know. <laughs> Last week, we talked about uh, I'm moving alone quickly. Uh, we was dealing with giving thanks. And uh, I really spoke about, you know, how do we show our thanks. And one of the things I talked about <clears throat> was um, our testimony. We show our thanks and we give our thanks through our testimony. And... That just kept lingering in my spirit throughout the week, and so I just, even though we were in New York, you know, I I just was taking my time throughout the week, some quiet time, and studying it. And I started seeing several things there. One of the things I see is one of the greatest tools that we have as a believer is our testimony. Because the reality is, and we say this quite often, you might be the only Bible some people ever read is your testimony. Sometimes we mess up our testimony, but by the grace of God, we can redeem it. But as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about myself as a young boy when I was fighting Junior Olympics. I had a coach, and his name was Tommy Nickens. And Tommy was probably one of the baddest dudes in town. Amen. This guy was bad to the bone. He was tough. He was a man's man. I mean, he just, he would just soon fight you than than, than talk to you. He was just just a tough guy. And he was my coach and, of course, uh, had a foul language. I mean, just just one of these rough characters. One of these guys that you would probably see in the post office on the wall. Amen. (laughs) But I remember as a young teenager going to this church, and it was on a Sunday night, and I looked up and I saw Tommy in the church service. And as the church service began to wind down, as they gave an altar call at the end, I saw Tommy begin to cry like a a baby, weeping, and he ran to the altar and got radically saved. And to this day, Tommy's still serving the Lord. Matter of fact, his son-in-law is Greg Jones, who preaches for us quite often. Many of you love Greg when he comes. That's his son-in-law. But I said that to say this. When I saw that, I realized the testimony of Tommy was the fact that if God can save Tommy, he can save anybody. (laughs) Amen? And so if he can save Tommy, he can save me. And so what a great testimony to see somebody go through something like that and see a radical change in your life. And it speaks volumes to you. So that being said, I want to jump over to Revelations. We have John who has a vision, and he's speaking here, and there's several things he's saying. But in Revelations 12... I read this last week. We pick up in verse 10. <laughs> he says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now, sal- now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of the brother has, who accused them 
before our God day and night has been cast down. Verse 11. And really, it's, it's really ironic whenever, you know, you're in tune with the Holy Spirit and Caleb, who does not know what I'm preaching, has the, the, the sings this part in, in a song, and, and it really brings it out, and, and it just really speaks volumes to me. But he said this in the song, and this is what he says in chapter, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Now, when we see this, we understand that the blood of the Lamb is Christ. Okay, so they overcame him by Christ and by the word of their testimony. The power of their testimony allows us to overcome. Amen? Because there's people in this room that is saved today, come on, because of somebody's testimony. Many times people come to me and they say, Pastor, I don't know how to witness. I don't know how to tell people about Jesus. Well, let me just break it down for you. It's really simple, really simple. Tell them what God done for you. When you begin to tell people about what Jesus done for you, you begin to share your testimony, you have power in the words that you speak because you have power in your testimony. When people see something, a, a, major, a, a major metamorphosis take place in your life, they know that God is real. I, I joke about this and I laugh about this. We go back home and I see people I hadn't seen in years and they see me and they're like, hey, Bobby, behind the the blankety blank or you old blankety blank? What in the blank are you doing these days? And I'm like, oh, pastor church. They're like, oh, you don't see, you know. They get this real strange look. Why? Because they know the old Bobby. And because of my testimony, I'm not that person anymore. And so God is good. Now, let me say a couple of things, and I want to I kind of give us some rules about this. And one of the things that I want you to understand is, is this. We can debate, and, and now don't get me wrong when I say this, but you can debate different issues in the Scripture, okay? There are people that's going to argue about certain things in the Scripture. Now, there's absolutes that you cannot argue about. Right? You cannot argue about the blood of Jesus Christ without it for the remission of your sins. You can't argue that. There are some things you can debate, some things you can argue about. But the truth is, the truth is, unless you are a known liar, come on, you cannot argue about a person's testimony. Come on. Because your testimony is going to be what it is. It is what it is. And so if you want to walk in truth, walk in the right testimony. Now, I'm going to give you some warnings. And one of the first warnings I want to give you is this. When you have a testimony and you share a testimony, you got to know when and whom you can share it with. Amen. Come on. Yeah. Have you ever met somebody that begin to share things with you and you're thinking to yourself, I wish I really didn't know that? Yeah. <laughs> and the truth is you probably shouldn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. There are some things you don't want to tell. Yeah. And there are some things you have the right person to tell it to. Yeah. And you got to be careful who you do that with. Now, I use this as an illustration because it's in the Scripture, and I, and I, and I think it's just a wonderful uh, uh, illustration, is we find in the book of Luke where there was a guy by the name of Zachari uh, Zachariah. Zachariah was a priest. He was a priest, and he was forming his duties, and he was doing all these things. And the Spirit of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, came and spoke to him and said, you're going to have a son, and his name's going to be John, which we refer back to John the Baptist. Okay, now all of a sudden now he's there. And of course, he says some things he shouldn't say and he becomes deaf and now he's writing everything out and he goes home and he tells Elizabeth and Elizabeth, you know, she gets pregnant and the whole nine yards. And now you got to remember, this is a miracle by itself because they too are up in age. Okay, now now Elizabeth's pregnant and she's running probably in about a six month and, and you keep following the scripture and you go to a place where the angel of the Lord came to this lady we know as Mary. Now Mary was what we call Mother Mary. Mary was a virgin. And the angel of the Lord spoke to Mary and said, Mary, you're going to have a child. Now Mary's thinking to herself, you know what? I'm not the brightest person in the world, but I know it takes a man to have a child. And all of a sudden Mary's going, how can this be so? I've never been with a man. And all of a sudden, finally Mary realizes the angel of the Lord is speaking to her and finding favor with her. And Mary says, you know what? I don't understand this, but let it be so. Amen. Now all of a sudden, now Mary is with child. Now watch this. Mary's with child, and all of a sudden, the angel says, your cousin Elizabeth is also with child. So now Mary with child goes and visits Elizabeth. Now she walks into the room, and, and now Elizabeth, in about a sixth month, seventh month, whatever it is, enough to feel the baby. And all of a sudden, now Mary walks into the room, and the Bible says that the baby inside of Elizabeth began to leap inside of her. Now this is what I, my thought here today, is this. Many of you, when God touches your life, God impregnates you with a vision. God impregnates you with a testimony. God begins to do things in your life radically. 
But all of a sudden, now God is a God that says, you know what? I'm going to give you somebody to help you with that testimony. And so Mary goes and says, you know what? I'm going to see my cousin Elizabeth. And she goes in, and the testimony that Mary's carrying, that a lot of people want to put her away for, come on, somebody. Because you can imagine her going around town going, hey, I'm pregnant. I've never been with a man. They're like, oh, yeah? Wait till that hits Facebook. Amen? <clears throat> but all of a sudden, now, the baby leaps inside of Elizabeth. Now, here's what God wants to do for us. When we're impregnated with that vision, and when we see the right person that God puts in our life, and we share, come on, when we share that testimony, that baby that's birthed inside of us should leap for joy. Because, see, if, if we don't, and we share it with the wrong person, that same person that we share it with could abort that mission. Come on, somebody. Are you talking about something you know, Pastor? Yeah, I know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Because, see, there's been times in my life where I felt like God had given me something. And maybe just out of being zealous, yeah, maybe just being out of excitement, maybe I just shared it with the wrong person and they say the wrong thing. Because, see, there's life and there's death in the tongue. Yeah, and saying it to the wrong person could totally abort yeah, that baby, yeah. abort that mission. And so as a warning of you today is the fact is when God bursts that testimony inside of you, you need to have the, the, the Spirit of the Lord inside of you to, to direct you and tell you who you can tell to and who you can't tell it to. Amen? Now here's the first thing that we need. The first thing that we need if we're going to walk in the Spirit of the Lord and the first thing we're going to need to carry out that godly testimony in our life which carries on from the same story I just told you is this, is we need the power of the Holy Ghost inside of us. Now, why do you say that, Pastor? Let's go back and look at Acts. Acts 1, 4, 8. It's talking about the Holy Spirit promise. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Now, we go back. That goes back to John. Okay, remember in John when he said, the comforter is going to come? I'm going to leave, but the comfort is going to come. And the comfort is going to comfort. The comfort is going to lead you in the truth. The comfort is going to guide you. The comfort is going to give you all these things. Now, let me just share, share with you today. If you're sitting there today, and you don't have a clue what I'm talking about, you need to really check your salvation. Because, see, the comfort of the Holy Spirit is the one. There are things that we read all the time that we don't understand. And if you don't never understand nothing about God, I'm just praying today that the comfort inside of you will lead you and guide you into truth. Because, see, the more you allow the comforter to guide you and lead you and give you that truth, the more you read, the more you study, the more you begin to learn. Because the comforter is what we need. Without the comforter, we're in trouble. Because, see, in reality, what we say don't make any sense. Come on. See, this Bible that we read on a daily basis, the Bible that we have, it's a crazy book. It's a crazy book. You don't believe me? Go back and read some of it for yourself. It's a crazy book. There's things in the Bible that are just in, in the light of, of, of man or reality of man today. Some of you that don't know Christ and don't believe. See, if you don't believe in the beginning God spoke this thing into existence, you're in trouble already. Come on. See, we, I, I laugh and I, and I tell this as a joke and I say I, I believe the Bible and I believe in the bang theory. Somebody said, the bang theory? Oh, my God. I believe God said it and bang it happened. We need to believe that. We need to believe the word from cover to cover. I believe the cover. It says genuine. I believe it's genuine leather. Amen? Come on. I believe it all. I believe every bit of it. You see, the Holy Spirit, whenever we allow the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us, the Bible says that Holy Ghost will lead you, will guide you into all truth. We need the power of God operating in our life. And so if we're going to have a godly testimony, we need God to operate totally in our life. He keeps going to say, and I said this because he said, go and wait for me. Now, we go back in Corinthians, and I'm not trying to build a doctrine on this, but in Corinthians, he said he was seen by 500. Go back and study it. He said he was seen by 500. But we studied later on, and we read up in the upper room. How many was left in the upper room? 120. Right? So what happened to the 380? They got tired of waiting. That's exactly right, you know? And so there was 380, and they got tired of waiting around, so there was only 120 of them left. Now, don't be the one who gets tired of waiting today. Amen? Amen? For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, this is what it's here for, when they have come together, they ask him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of heaven? See, at this time, they still kind of confused. 
Now you've got to remember, he's been telling the whole time what he's going to do, and now they're, they're asking something totally different. And I can imagine Jesus is probably going, Dude, have you been paying attention all this time? And he says this, And he said to them, It is not for you to know the time and the season which the Father has put in his own authority. God has everything under control. Verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Why? And you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem. You shall be a testimony to me in Jerusalem. Leesville, Fort Polk. Come on, somebody. Amen. Hornbeck. Amen. Amen. In all Judea, Samar, and the end of the earth, which is Leesville. Amen. Amen. All of it. All of us. Amen. He's going to look. God wants to give us a testimony. And the only way we're going to get a testimony is we're going to walk through a test. Now, here's another thing here that we have to see. We must see this. It's always, without a doubt, if you're going to have a godly testimony, our godly tes testimony must always give all glory to God. Go. Amen? Now, I hear people all the time, they want to spend 45 minutes bragging on how bad they were and spend the last 30 seconds. Yeah, God saved me. And we're talking about how bad they are and how, how much sin they cause and all this kind of stuff. And there's a time for, to share testimonies in that, in that aspect. But let me tell you something. Every testimony we have today, everything should point to Christ. Amen. Everything should say, you know what? Yeah, I've been through that, but it wasn't for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here. Amen. Yeah, I did that, but it wasn't for the grace of God, I wouldn't have that. Yeah, yeah I, I've seen that, but it wasn't for the grace of God, I wouldn't have survived that. Amen. You see, my testimony is this. I was just a lost boy in South Louisiana, and God saved me. Amen. God delivered me. Amen. See, it always points. Even, even King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he says this. He says this over in uh, uh, Daniel 4.1. King Nebuchadnezzar sent his messenger to the people, every race and nation and language. That's us right here today. Amen? Amen. Throughout the world, peace and prosperity to you, he says. And he says to them, I want you all to know about the, the, the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. He's telling, listen, I want you to know about God, what he did for me. How great are his signs. How powerful is his wonders. His kingdom is, will last forever. His rule through all generations. He's doing what? He's giving all the glory to God. Amen. He's pointing, listen, man, let me tell you what happened to me. God be the glory. Yeah. You see, when I stand in this pulpit... And many have stand before in pulpits all over this nation. And I hear these stories and, and how horrible some of these stories are. And you hear these pastors that perhaps fell into sin and perhaps had a bad marriage and fell into adultery or perhaps did all these horrible things. I, I, I'd say real quick this. This is what I say. If it wasn't for the grace of God, that could be me. Yeah, come on now. Come on. See, I never get to the point where I say, well, that never happened to me. Right. <laughs> I, I, I'll never do that. Why? Because I'm fooling myself if I, if I think that. I'm fooling myself if I think... Listen, there are people in this room today that have done things and they're going, I can't believe I've done that. Yeah. Do you think people wake up one morning as a young child and go, man, I can't wait one day when I grow up I'm going to be a junkie? I can't wait one day when I get married so I can cheat on my wife? You think they wake up like that? No, that just happens. Why? Because we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we allow some things in our life that shouldn't be in our life. But it wasn't for the grace of God, any one of us is what happened to. It's God's grace that delivers us from all these things. We've got to give always grace to God. Here's the next thing. Here's the next thing right here about your testimony. Don't try and fool others with empty, vain words. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Listen, your testimony is your testimony. Your testimony is not my testimony. And my testimony is not your testimony. So don't go around trying to give some kind of something that you're not. Because, listen, God's going to use what you are. Come on. Don't try to be somebody else. Don't give a, And the reality is, listen, with the Internet today, people can figure it out. Nowadays, you can't hide from it. And I'll tell you this, kids and, and young adults, brother, if you're applying for a job, be careful what you put out there. Be careful the pictures you put out there. Be careful because it never goes away. It's out there. And, and listen, today with technology, there are people out there that hire people that know how to do things that they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, and they figure out real quick who you are and what you're not. Yeah. Yeah. And so don't come around with empty words. and trying to, You can't go around. Listen, one of the things that bothers me when somebody comes to me and I'm trying to help them and they're going to try to lie to me. Yeah. That's empty words. Why are you going to lie to me? If you're going to lie to me, you're, you're, not, you're wasting my time. You see, how can we have a testimony if we're going to lie with the empty? This is what the Bible says. It says over in um, 
Ephesians 5, 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Be careful what you say. Amen? Amen. Here's the next thing. And this is one most important. When we do have a testimony, we must remember what King David said. And King David said this in Psalms 107. He says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And this is what he says, and this is the part that we should pick up on. Verse 2, let the redeem of the Lord say so. When we've been redeemed, we need to say so. You know, I I see people, and I don't understand this, and and forgive me for being somewhat naive in this area, but if you've been working with somebody for 10 years and they don't know you're a believer, there's an issue there. Well, well, I just think, you know, we need to separate, we need to separate our, our... No, you don't. How can you separate yourself from, from your job or whatever? If you redeem, say so. Amen. Let the redeem of the Lord say so. Amen. David said, let the redeem of the Lord say so. We should say so in our testimonies. We should say so in our, in our work ethics. We should say so when we work for somebody by the hour. We should give them an hour's work. We should say so by, by, we were traveling back uh, on a flight from from New York to uh, uh, Houston. And nowadays, if you don't know this and if you haven't traveled in a while, things are not free anymore. (laughs) Nothing's free anymore. You want to watch TV, you've got to swipe your credit card. If you want a a sandwich, you've got to pay for it. Everything you've got to pay for. And so we were flying back and and we were a little hungry. It was like a three-hour flight. And so the lady comes by, and she, she has some sandwiches and some chips. And I said, give me a couple of sandwiches and a chip. And, and she says, I'll come back in a minute and get your credit card. And I said, okay. And so she leaves, and she goes, and we eat our sandwich, and our chips are gone. And she's never coming back, and she hadn't showed back up. And finally, the flight's almost done. And so finally, I, I motioned over to, her, the, to the lady, one of the ladies, and said, ma'am, I said, never came back and got my, 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 my credit card. I said, you never came back and let me pay for the, the stuff that I got. And she looked at me with this look in her eye like, that's exactly what she said. She says, she goes, I've never had anybody do that to me before. And she says, oh, my God. And you know what she said? She says, please, keep it. <laughs> it's on me. I was like, cool, you have another sandwich? No, she <laughs> While the redeemed say so, give me another one, amen? <laughs> but you know what? You know what that done to her? That, she probably had to look and go, the redeemed is saying so. The Redeemer saying so. Because, see, the world is all trying to give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. What can I cheat you from? Instead of saying, hey, you know what? I want to pay my way. Hey, what can I, what can I do? What can I give back? You know? Let the Redeemer of the Lord say so. Amen. Can I tell you something? Listen, you'll never get ahead by cheating people. You'll never get ahead by, by squishing somebody or trying to make a, you know, advantage to somebody. You know how you can get ahead in life? You give your way through it. When you begin to give back to others, God opens his hands and begins to give back to you. Amen. And we learned that early on in our ministry. I remember first I went and preached for this, this guy. Uh, he, had a, he had his master's in, in communications. And I ain't going to lie to you. It was a church in, in, in Texas. And, and, and this guy's church was let the redeem of the Lord, Father, Aunt Sue's brothers, cousins, Jesus Christ ministries. I mean, it's one of those. You ever had those ministries with 40 names? I, I can't remember it all. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, I got lost at the first thing you said in that thing. But at the end of the night, at the end of the night, he gave us an, uh, an offering, and, and, he, and he asked us to come by his house, and we went by with the kids and stuff. And he said to me, he said, listen, he says, I've been in ministry for a period of time, and he said, let me give you some advice. He says, you want to make it in ministry? Because we had just got back from Russia. We had just flew back in the States, and we had, were traveling, and we were ministering in different places. And he said to me, he said, if you want to make it in ministry, give your way through it. Remember him saying that to us? And I thought to myself, well, no, we need it. <laughs> but you know what happened? I caught a hold of that. And pretty soon, man, my wife had to hide the checkbook. Yeah. True story? Yeah. Every time I was getting mad, because it seemed like the more I would try to help elders, God just kept bringing it back. Yeah. Why? Because that's the kind of God he is. Yeah. When we understand, let the redeem of the Lord say so. Yeah. Why? Because yeah. if we're redeemed, then you know what? Let's say so. Let's say with, with however we do it, in, in our helping somebody, in our giving to somebody, or picking up somebody, or feeding somebody, let the Redeemer of the Lord say so. Whew. I hope that got that part of it. Amen? Amen? Here's another part here. Okay? Now, what I want to do is I want to try to jump over to this. What should a good, God-fearing, God-believing, godly person's testimony look like? What should it look like? You ready for this? Here's the first part here. A God-believing, God-fearing testimony... 
should see, you should see this. All their trials, they count them as joy. All the trials they go through, they begin to count as joy. Now, it gets quiet when you talk about that. Because the truth is, none of us in this room, including myself, don't want to go through trials. But you know what? With your testimony is when you do go through trials, you go, God, I'm going to count it as joy. Because obviously, God, you knew that I could handle this. God, you knew that, 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 that I could use this. Because, see, we can all get mad about our trials. We can all pout about our trials. We can all throw a fit. We could be like a little small brat and stomp on the ground and kick our feet and do everything else. But the truth is, we're going to go through trials whether you like it or not. But James, in all his wisdom, says this. This is what he says in James 1. He says, my brethren, or sister, you want to fill in a blank there? He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete Lacking nothing. Okay? Then he goes on to say, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives liberty without reproach. And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. But let, no, but let not that man suppose that he receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man and unstable in all his ways. Jump down to verse 12. He's talking about the blessings here. Or loving God under these trials. It says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Which is trials. Now, let me stop right there for a second. Temptation by itself is not sin. Can I say it a little louder? Okay. Temptation by itself is not sin. It's yielding to the temptation. Okay. And I use this as an illustration. I remember a guy telling me this one time. He said, you see a mailbox, you recognize it's a mailbox, and you know it's a mailbox. But guess what? The problem comes when you start digging in the mailbox. You got that? Okay. He goes on to say this. He says, um, Blessed the man who endures the temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. God says if we love him, he does these things for us. Okay, we do all this. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted, how? When he is drawn away by his own desires and enticement, or enticed, amen? Verse 15. Then when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Okay? Do not be deceived, my brother, my beloved brother. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Going back to the top, count it all joy, right? Why? Because all things work for good for those who love the Lord. Okay? He goes on to say, he says, uh, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no... Very, which is, let's just jump down to... Let me jump down to, to, to verse uh, uh, 19. So then, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Did you get that? Okay. And so by throwing a fit and getting mad and getting all bent out of shape, it don't produce any righteousness. Now, just like the disciples, now, you we're all in a good boat together, okay? Because you have the disciples, and they're, they're with Christ. And they're seeing all these people fed, thousands of fed, the blind eyes open, the, the deaf hear, and the, the lame walking, seeing all this stuff. And all of a sudden, Jesus tells them, get in the boat, we're going to the other side. They get in the boat, they get halfway across there. Jesus is taking a nap because he's tired of all the miracles. Amen? He's taking a nap, and all of a sudden, the winds kick up, the storm starts beating the boat, and they're freaking out. They're freaking out. They're freaking out. So they go and wake him up, and all of a sudden, Jesus gets up. Now, he could have easily said, you big dummies. Didn't I tell you we're going to the other side? See, the truth is, we're all going to the other side. The truth is, you're going to make it, okay? But guess what? You're going to make it, and your testimony is going to be vibrant when you learn to count it a joy. When you go through trial. Listen, I use this because it's my testimony and my wife's testimony. Do you think by any chance that my wife and I enjoy going through a kidney transplant? Do you think that we really wanted to do that? No. By no means. But you know what? Now it's gone. It's happened. Man, I use it for, for God's glory. Amen. Every chance I get an opportunity to share with somebody who's going through something, I'm like, you know, we've been there and got T-shirts. Amen. And guess what? And here's the reality. 
And let me just be, this church, we're honest, okay? We're, we're very transparent to you. We're not hiding anything from you. The truth is, every month when my wife goes in for labs, we hold our breath. Because we don't know what we're going to get. From month to month, every time she goes in, we just kind of like, and I know when it's happening because I see her, her countenance begin to change. And at that point, I'm trying to lift her up because deep inside, I'm going, oh, God, please, let this be okay. Let this be okay. Now, why are you telling this, Pastor? Because I want you to understand trials are not fun. But when you learn to say, God, I don't understand this. God, I really, to be honest, don't want it. But, God, I trust you. I trust you, God. I trust you, Lord. God, you, 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 you got some kind of reason for this. Because all things, I want to give you the glory for it. Amen? Count it all joy. Here's the next one. And this is really most important. And, and this one here, I, I would say it's, it's for the young believers, but it's for everyone. Young and old. If you want a good godly testimony, you always, has, you always have to have an ear that hears. Let me say it again. You've got to have an ear that hears. Amen. Amen. You see, you can hear and not hear. Come on. Come on. Our kids do it all the time. They hear you, but they don't hear you. Yeah. Come on. You tell them to go to their room, and they nod their head, and they make the motions, and they might even go toward the room. You tell them to go to bed, and they nod their head and they do the motions, but they're playing their little games. The same thing with us as believers. God speaks to us. We hear him, but we really don't hear him. If we want to have a godly testimony, we need to hear with our ears and do it, what God says. Now, listen, let's, let me pull out some of the scriptures here, okay? Now, this is, before I pull out scripture, this is what, if you don't understand what I'm trying to say, let me say this also. God's testimony is always the ear, has an ear laid here, is this. <clears throat> you don't have to pet a snake to know that a snake bites. Okay? I'm telling you now. Snakes bite. So if you see a snake, you don't have to pet it and find out for yourself and come back with a nub. Hey, you know, that snake bit. Well, I told you it bit. You see what I'm saying? See, as a parent, we tell our kids all the time, don't do this because this is going to happen to you, but yet we do it. Yeah. It's like our kids, we tell them, don't mess with the electricity, and they got a little, little bobby pin or something sticking in it. You go in the room, and they light up like, like a bike light bulb, you know? The point is, you don't have to stick a pin to find out electricity is in that wall. Okay? Now, we got to hear, and this is what it says here. Several places. Well, I'll tell you what, let me just jump over to uh, Isaiah 50. He says here in verse 4, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I shall know how to speak. A word in season to him who is weary. And this is what's really cool. He awakes me morning by morning. And this is what he says. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. You see, sometimes our ears are sleeping. Sometimes when I'm preaching and you're thinking about what you're fixing to have for supper or lunch or whatever... I want to go, wake up, because you're not hearing me. You're thinking about, man, well, after this church service, I got that burger, I got that, got that chicken left over, I might me a sandwich, big old thing of mayonnaise, oh, that sounds so good, and you don't hear nothing. You zone out. Amen? Some of you just woke up. Y'all have too much tryptophan, amen? That's like a drug. Turkey has tryptophan, amen? You had too much of it. It's a legal drug. Now, it's what he says. He, he, he says here, he says, Awaken my ears to hear as to learn. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I will not rebel. I will not be rebellious, nor did I turn away. When we open our ears to hear, we hear what he has to say. Amen. Revelation says this in verse 2-7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And he goes on to say, To him who overcomes... I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. In other words, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Okay? Now, we need to overcome, or we will be overcome. Amen? We need to hear so we can overcome, or it will overcome us. You got that? 
Because, see, we're all adults in this room. But spiritually speaking, we're not all listening. Because the truth is, let's be honest. You ready for this? We don't want anybody to tell us what to do. By nature, we don't want people to tell you. How many times has somebody told you to do something and, and you just, just automatically rebelled? Yeah, come on now. Man. Just like, you know what? I'm do what I want to do. I'm, I'm a grown man. Yeah, come on now. I, do, I do what I want to do. We find even King Solomon or King Saul. That's how he got. He's like, I'm not Saul, Samuel. He's just a prophet. I'm the king. I'm not going to wait for him. I'll, I'll sacrifice when I want to sacrifice. That's why it's obedience is better than sacrifice. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. He says it again in verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To him who overcome, I will give him the hidden manner to eat. And I will give him a, a, a white stone and a stone, a new name, written, which no one knows except him who receives. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. You see, the, 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 more, the more mature that we are, the more we hear, the more we pay attention. Now, here's a reality. You wondering for this? I, and, and it's funny because I, I was telling my wife this week. <sighs> the older you get, the more you would have wished that you would have took care of yourself when you were younger. Amen. You don't know how many times as a young man you want to show off, reach down, and grab something that weighs more than you should be lifting and say, oh, I got it. <sighs> And when you get older, <laughs> you go, you can lift it. <laughs> Your back goes, eh. Now it's time for me to remind you. <laughs> I took a picture of my wife wanted me to take a picture. We were in the crowd with the, with the, the parades going behind us, and she wanted a shot where I can kind of go up and look up to, to Snoopy, I think it was, one of the shots. I can't remember which one it was. And I bend down in the crowd to take that shot, and I needed some help. <laughs> <laughs> Standing back up, what is easy as going down, amen? You, you get where I'm going? You understand? We, sh- we would pay more attention. Here's the next thing, and, and this is so important with our testimony. To have a good godly testimony, we must speak what we speak truth, whether it's truth or not, speak it out of love. You've got to speak truth in love. See, you can speak it all day long, but not have love. And, and you know what it's going to fall? It's going to fall on deaf ears. How many times, I remember my dad, and I won't tell you what he said to me, but I remember as a young boy going somewhere, and he said something to me, and he said it out of love. And I I remember that so well because I respected him so much more by saying it that way than him telling me, don't do that. Does that make sense? Because he knew that I was a grown man, and I mean, I was not a grown man, I was, you know, 18, 19 years old, and I was going on a trip, and he told me not to do something. And and he said it in a way that he knew that I was going to do it anyway. But he said it in a way, he said, look, I know you're going to do this, but he says, when you do this, don't do this. And I thought to myself, thank you for saying that, because he said it out of love. He didn't say it out of, don't you do that, because he knows. But he knew at that time, it didn't matter what he said, how he said it, because I was going to do what I wanted to do anyway. You see, if you're going to have a good godly testimony, when you speak to somebody, speak to them in love. Don't speak to them out of anger. And and here's here's what the Scripture says about that. Uh, I'll tell you what, let me just read this right here. Ephesians. Ephesians 4.11. And he himself gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Why did he do this? For the equipping of the saints, 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 saints. I'm sorry, I just got stuck there for a moment. For the work of the Super Bowl. I mean, for the work of the ministry. (laughs) For the edifying of the body of Christ. Why? Till we all come to the unity, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of of the Son of God to a perfect man. Till we all come to the unity. And he goes on to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children. See, children say things out of anger all the time. Tossed and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of the deceitful plotting. Verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, which is Christ. Then he goes on to say, from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by what every joint supplies, according to effective working, by every part does it share. It causes growth in the body. How? For the edifying of itself. How? In love. By speaking the truth in love. When you have a godly testimony, you need to speak truth in love. You know, I know for myself, we're not all perfect. 
you know, and, and sometimes we get angry and sometimes we want to just, just say things because we're mad, you know, and, and say, well, that's the truth. But the reality is, without speaking in love, you're not going anywhere, not getting anything done. And if we're going to have a good godly testimony, whatever we do and however we do it, we need to revert back to the agape love, which is an unconditional love. Because, see, guess what? People are going to upset you. People are going to make you mad. And people are not going to do what you tell them to do. Now, how do you know that, Pastor? I pastor for 17 years. I know all about it. I mean, you try. You, you want to help people, and you try to help people, and you tell people. And, and you look, if you do this, this, you know, let me help you here. Let me show you this. And they're like, uh oh, and they go do what they want to do. And then they come back to you when they're in trouble. And the truth is, you know, you really want to go, nana, nana, boo, boo, get it yourself, you know. But the truth is, you want to love them, and you go back and you help them again. You know, when people say, well, did so-and-so hurt you? Yeah, they hurt me. But you know what? If they asked me, I'd go back and help them again. Why? Because that's my nature. You know? Because I realize, guess what? People are people. And the only time we're going to be perfect is when we get into our sanctified bodies. There's none of us in this room perfect. If you think you're perfect, then I've got some water I want to see you walk on. Amen? But none of us are perfect. Not, not, a, not a person in this room is perfect. But when we learn to say, and this is really our prayer, God, give me wisdom to speak to other people. God, give me wisdom to speak in love. Because, you, look, there are times when, when you're mad and you don't want to say any, nothing out of love. Love is the furthest thing from your mind. But guess what? You find out, my mom told me a long time ago, you get more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. I know some of you don't even understand that saying, but it's true. You get more people with sweetness than you do with sourness. Amen? And so do it out of love. Amen? And here's really one of the last things today is this, it's simply this, talking about a real godly testimony, and there's two parts of this right here. The first one is this, a real godly testimony understands that there's a time and place for everything. Ecclesiastes, King Solomon wrote, which you thought King Solomon wouldn't even say when he said vanity, vanity, but later on he writes this, he says, to everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep solid and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. There's a time for everything. And the last part of that part there is simply this. If we're going to maintain a godly, God-believing, God-fearing testimony, you've got to taste and see how good he is. Amen. If you don't taste it, you never know. Yes, come on now. I can tell you, I can point, I can show you, but until you taste him and trust, you never know how good he is. Amen. And the more that we taste... And the more that we trust, the more we realize how good he is. Amen. He says in Psalms 34, David writes here, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who tastes in him. I trust in him. <laughs> taste and see. You see, all through life, we taste. We trust. As a child, when your mom tried to get you to eat things that you thought you just didn't like and was good for you, whether it's broccoli or whatever, and the whole time, they're going, taste it, taste it, taste it, taste it, taste it. I don't like broccoli, okay? I tasted it, and I did not see. I will. Let's go back to snap beans. I used to think snap beans were horrible. I used to think cabbage was horrible until it was cooked right. You know, when I learned to cook it in a black skillet, I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. You know? Sometimes I'm like, glad you're on the front row. <laughs> taste and see, amen? Sometimes you've got to taste it and see, and sometimes you've got to drive all the way to the south to taste it, amen? I laugh because there was a lady in the church, and uh, her name slips me. Blonde hair lady used to have from Chicago. Help me out. Adrian, thank you. She was a trip. If you didn't know her, she was a trip. She had a really big mouth. I'm just being honest. And we used her in, in children's church because she was very loud, very boisterous. But I'll never forget, we're having this function, and we're eating in the back. 
And she comes up to me and she's got this plate in her hand. And she goes, oh my God, this is good. And she says, I don't know what it is. She says, it's got this like banana taste and, and like, like, like pudding. What is it? I said, banana pudding. <laughs> I've never tasted this before. Oh my God. And she starts eating it, you know. And you're thinking to yourself, I thought everybody had banana pudding in their bottles growing up. Amen, you know. Banana pudding? Who's never tasted banana pudding? Anybody in this room? Oh my God. We're going to give a salvation message after this. Amen. If I ever go, I want to drown in banana pudding. Amen. Just throw me in. I'm done. Taste and see. You never know until you taste. And to taste, it simply means to try. You know, I, I, I was sharing several things this morning about that. And, and one of them I was talking about was myself personally. And I was talking about how when God called me to the ministry to pastor, and for those who've been here any length of time, Kevin and some of those around me know this, but when I first started pastoring, one of the things that I did not want to do was preach. I mean, you think that's funny, but it's true. I mean, I, I, I wanted to pastor, but I didn't want to preach. I, I just, I was so afraid. When Saturdays came around, I hated Saturdays because I knew Sunday was next. I mean, I would literally just freak out every Saturday. Oh, my God, tomorrow's Sunday. Oh, we're going to, oh. I mean, it was just like I just didn't want to. But then finally one day I said, God, you called me to pastor that I need to preach, you know. <laughs> Why are you saying that? Because sometimes you've got to taste and see. Amen. Sometimes it's not in our, in, in our DNA or not in our, 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 our palates, you know, so to speak. But you know what? God is going, come over here and try this. Come over here and sample this. Because the whole time, we're like little kids with our mouths closed. Mm, I ain't going to taste it. And God's going, I've got something really good for you. Just taste and see. Trust me in this. And when you do, it opens a whole new palate. I remember the day that y'all were talking about those fried uh, 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 Oreo cookies. And, 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 and your husband cooked them too. But the first time I ever tried one was over there. And I'll be honest with you. When somebody sent me a fried Oreo cookie, I thought, that don't sound good at all. Taste and see. <laughs> I was next in line. Every time I was like, oh, get out of my way. I want that Oreo. And then we went over Russell's house, and he fried them up too. And I was like, taste and see. Why? Because they were good. But in your mind, you're thinking, fried Oreo? I mean, I told my brother-in-law about it last night because he's coming down to stay with us. I said, we're going to fry some Oreos for you. He's like, He's thinking fish batter, you know. He said, what kind of batter are you battering? And I was like, no, it's more like a pancake batter. Well, that makes a little bit more sense. But the whole time I'm thinking fried, I'm thinking fish or, or shrimp or whatever. And I'm thinking, man, flour, that don't sound good, you know, on an Oreo cookie. But you taste and see. And the same thing this morning. Maybe you're here today. Maybe, maybe God has been birthing something inside of you. Because, listen, the more we grow, the more we need you. You see, there's people that... that there are times when we, we cry out and we say, you know, we need help. And, and, and we say, what do you need help in? And we're like, well, we need help in the nursery. And people say, well, I don't feel led to do that. We don't feel led to change diapers. I'm like, taste and see, you know. <laughs> Not a good term, but, you know. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, sometimes things that, that we don't want to do, God's going to try to bring you through that to get you somewhere else. Amen. Amen. You know, I, I know that to be true in my own life. Every time I stepped out and said, God, I'm going to taste what you have for me, God's going, good, because I brought you there to bring you here. Taste this, and you taste that. He's like, okay, now you got that, I'm going to bring you here. And you constantly taste and see. Taste and see. Taste and see how good God is. Let your testimony one day stand and say, I tasted and I saw how good God is. Father, we thank you for this time together. And God, I pray that this word penetrates the hearts of your people. And God, I know that in a crowd this size, many times we go through things in our testimony for whatever reason. We struggle. We have struggled in areas of trusting you in trials and tribulations. God, we trusted you in areas of maybe telling the wrong person. God, many things that I said today, God, let it, let it come from you. But if you're here this morning, heads bowed, eyes closed, and you say, Pastor, something you said today about testimony, 
really ministered to me, really spoke to my heart, and it's an area that I really need prayer in. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you as I would never do. But if you're here today and you say, Pastor, this is an area I want prayer in, pray for me. Just raise your hand and put it back down. That's you this morning. Thank you, Father. I see hands all over, all over. Anyone else? Just put it up put it down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. See those hands. Anyone else? Just pray for me, Pastor. Thank you, Father. God, I thank you so much. Your word never returns void. God, I pray today that as we spoke about testimonies and we want to have a good godly testimony, God, maybe there's someone today that they feel like their testimony has been ruined because of a bad decision, a bad choice. That's just a lie from the pits of hell. God, you can redeem everything and let the redeemed say so. God, we have been redeemed. We've been saved by your grace. And God, it's by your mercy that we even have a godly testimony. So God, today, each hand that was lifted, whatever they need, God, provide, be with them, give them strength. Now, Father, as heads are bowed, eyes are closed, maybe you're here today for the first time and you say, Pastor, or maybe you've been coming for some time and you say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. Or maybe you might even say, Pastor, there was a time I was serving the Lord, but I realized that I'm just backslidden and I want to get that right this morning. I don't want to leave this place not knowing that my heart's right with Jesus. Right there between you and God, just from the heart, just begin to say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I repent. Jesus, come to my life today. Jesus, I want to make you my Savior and my Lord. If you prayed that prayer this morning, maybe for the first time, or maybe a prayer of rededication, again, it doesn't matter. I just want to pray for you. If you prayed that prayer, right where you at, just raise your hand and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. See hands all over. Thank you, Father. God, you see these hands, and God, I pray that you get them plugged in, and God, I pray that you get the right person speaking into their life, and God, whatever they need, you're God that provides. And Father, I pray right now blessings on them. Be with them, watch over them, and guide them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you receive that word, let's give God a hand this morning. Amen.